We're living in a world in which everyone expects the best of everything with the unhinged sense of entitlement that used to be the sole reserve of insane Roman emperors or members of the Bullingdon Club. The more we want, the less satisfied we feel. Happiness seems perpetually out of reach. Why? Maybe somewhere along the way we started actually believing what this little electronic bullshitter was feeding us. This week, how TV ruined your life by guffing dreams into your living room. Don't say it didn't. It did. Only two things separate us from the beasts. One, the beasts are terrible at changing duvet covers. They tend to pull them over their heads and then panic because the sun's disappeared. And two, the beasts don't use money. They've got no idea what it is or what it's for. Have you ever seen a dog confronted by a credit card? It just looks like a four-legged idiot. Money is terrible. It's just a depressing way of boiling our wonderful world down to a set of grey, eyeless, dickless little numbers and then using them to screw each other over. Oh, one for me and one for you. Oh, you've got one more than me. I'm going to stab you in the ribs. That's what money is. Once you've accumulated plenty of money, TV encourages you to invest it all in a box made of bricks. Rich people used to stop us noticing how privileged they were by tinting their car windows or hiding behind high walls where you couldn't kill them. But now TV allows you a peek behind the gates and frankly it's harrowing. Cribs is a highly successful variant of Through the Keyhole in which a very rich person shows you the rewards which society has granted them for being important and successful and loved. And you have to guess who in God's tit they are. What up MTV, it's your boy Mims and welcome to my crib. Come inside. Oh yeah, right, it's your boy Mims. Uh, we're going round your boy Mims's house, everyone. I don't know why he's famous. Maybe, maybe he invented super noodles. It's effectively a shopping channel of stuff that could have been yours if you'd been born in America and learned to rap rather than sitting on your arse in Taunton watching Cribs. Cribs dangles the aspiration carrot so impractically out of reach they might as well put it on a million mile long stick tied to a rocket that's been fired into a black hole. People have always wanted nice houses, obviously, they're not mad, but back in the day, your options were limited. If you were poor, you had to live in a cramped tin full of relatives and cholera. If you were middle class, you had a bigger home, and if you were a member of the aristocracy, you lived in Downton Flippin' Abbey. People largely accepted whichever kind of hovel they'd been allotted, and then in the 80s, Thatcher legalised council houses or whatever, and suddenly everyone wanted one. And glamorous TV ads made the dream look attainably easy. Mm, washing machine, fridge, oven and hob. And we can afford it with Wimpy's financial help, can't we? The ultimate in homemade pornography has to be pornography made from homes. Televised aspirational showrooms such as Channel 4's Grand Designs, which offers a tantalising glimpse of the kind of dream house you too could be dwelling in if only you had several hundred thousand pounds and or six months of leisure time to spare. The presenter, Kevin MacLeod, whose name even makes him sound like a man who's stepped out of a dream, fronts the show in the manner of an enthusiastic curator leading you on a personal tour around a museum of cosy middle-class satisfaction. Because it's a listed building, the exterior will have to remain comparatively unchanged. I like these bits because they're a bit like a video game, albeit a painfully middle-class one. In fact, I'd put Grand Design's CGI walkthrough at number one in my list of the four most middle-class video games of all time, just ahead of School Run Turismo, Super Artisan Breadmaker and Nigel Slater's Coriander Panic. Largely, though, it's an envy generator as we shit sofa'd schlubs look on moving from mild interest to outright fury. Oh, that's a nice fireplace. What a wonderfully huge kitchen. Oh, I love the way the windows let the light into their lovely house. Oh, they've got a pool. Oh, you've got a fucking pool. Thanks to shows like this, it somehow feels like it's not enough to just own a reasonably OK house anymore. Instead, you can feel a lingering sense of failure for dwelling inside anything other than an architecturally fascinating 4,000-foot translucent diagram with a gigantic mauve egg in the middle for you and your revolting kids to shit into. Ugh, depressing. Still, at least you can comfort eat. Food is another aspirational touchstone. It's not good enough to simply heat up a pie anymore. No, today you're supposed to be some kind of gastronomic show pony with a signature dish of your own. This rat's coming along nicely. Once upon a time, cookery programmes used to concentrate on the business of cookery. Well, today we're going to take a look at some recipes using offal, or spare parts as I like to call it, because I never did like the word offal. Anyway, whatever you call it, offal or spare parts, 
Liver and kidneys are certainly very good for us, and most nutritionists suggest that we should eat them well at least once a week to be really healthy and get all the correct vitamins that we need. Whereas today's cookery shows are less about food and more about lifestyle. Take the delicious Miss Dahl in which a blonde supermodel floats around a lovely kitchen bibbling on about foodie wood. A good bit of lemon zest. I think to have a dish named after you, you have to be a bit of a diva. I do, however, I think have a bra named after me. Much rather have a dish, but I have a bra. Huh, certainly makes my mouth water, which is handy, because it also makes me feel like spitting at the screen. Still, if the way you feed your family has become an aspirational lifestyle choice, so has having a family full stop. Hey, parent, do you remember when you biologically converted a spoonful of recently expelled gunk into one of these screaming attention seekers? Well, little did you realise that what you were doing was creating a living, breathing status symbol, although that is precisely what you were doing. And advertisers know how much parents adore their kids, so they shit out aspirational ads that prey on their paternal instincts and heighten the sense that these magical imps need protection. One problem with treating kids like delicate Fabergé eggs is you become so dementedly paranoid about any misfortune befalling them that you end up sealing them indoors around the clock, effectively locking them in a prison that serves organic food in which every surface has been sprayed 86 times with antibacterial disinfectant before those fingers can touch it. So they sit there indoors, growing up in the flickering glare of aspirational imagery, soaking it all up, brightly coloured kids shows which make stardom seem both attainable and desirable, swanky seductive adverts where a celebrity tells you you're special. Because where were they? And glossily packaged celebrity piddle like the Saturdays 24-7, which largely consists of banal footage of singing Five Knuckle Shuffle the Saturdays, punting about like children, dressing up, drawing, playing with their soft toys, dressing up, tickling each other, making and doing, dressing up, playing here we go round the mulberry bush, dressing up as their mums, dressing up, climbing the trees, face painting and dressing up. One natural consequence of long-term exposure to this kind of piffle is the kids who watch it grow up wanting to be treated like celebrities themselves, becoming self-obsessed little emperors in the process. For evidence, tune into MTV's My Super Sweet 16. Not so much a show, more an orchestrated smear campaign against humankind in general. Some of it is punishingly depressing. For instance, here, a brat's mum buys her a $67,000 Lexus for her birthday. Happy birthday! What the hell? I don't want my car now! Happy birthday. No! What the hell? I don't want my car now! Come on! But she's unhappy, because she didn't want it until the night of her birthday party. I can't believe she's such an idiot! I, she just ruined the whole party! Everything! She just ruined everything! You ruined my life! I hate you! We're leaving! The party's off! Um, you know, I think this might actually be an Al-Qaeda recruitment film. Far from being just an American thing, this kind of ostentatious kiddie spoiling has now leapt across the Atlantic and onto our shores and has its own British spin-off, My Super Sweet 16 UK. Here, in a characteristically unedifying episode, we meet a young lad called Freddy, who's more spoiled than the average ancient Babylonian prince. He lives in a massive house, has a racehorse named after him, is driven everywhere in a huge limousine, and thinks nothing of blowing a fortune on gaudy bling bullshit. Freddy's birthday is fast approaching, but rather than setting up a Facebook page or sending out invites like a normal Earth-dwelling citizen, he holds an X-Factor-style audition to decide who can attend. You all ready to be judged? <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's bad news. You're going to have to spend a lot of money on a brand new outfit because you're coming to the party. Come on! Come the night itself, he arrives in a choreographed simulation of a red carpet celebrity event. We want pay. We want pay. It's a strange thing, really, to think that within my lifetime, teenage aspirations have morphed from being able to pull off a pretty good BMX trick or having fewer spots to being showered with adulation like your Lady Gaga and Peter Andre crossed with God. Make no mistake, the next generation is going to be horrible. If I was Education Secretary, which I'm not currently, I'd force every school in the country to run cartoons telling kids they were worthless just to counterbalance it all. Howie the Hare was gaily hopping down Dingle Bell Way one morning when he stopped. He looked up into the clouds and he was struck by the notion of just how insignificant he was in the grand scheme of things. How it didn't matter if he wanted carrots for dinner or if his paw hurt or even if he caught his cheek on some barbed wire and got an infected face and died. None of these things mattered a squit, he realised, because despite what Mummy kept saying, he didn't matter a squit, which is why it didn't matter that moments later he was killed by a meteorite. <laughs> 
way back yonder, you know, in the past, folk only achieved a level of what might be termed celebrity by displaying a remarkable level of talent. Whereas during the current confused period of human history, it's apparently possible to become famous merely for inhaling and exhaling on camera. The galaxy of fame has a complex, ever-shifting hierarchy burning brightest to the proper stars, actors and musicians and the like. Some become super giants like Beyonce or Brad Pitt and they're also insanely powerful. This bona fide constellation also includes some dwarf stars. For example, Adam Woodyatt, who plays Ian Beale, is one of the most recognisable faces in Britain. But because he plays a fish and chip shop owner, people consider him intrinsically low rent and almost certainly treat him accordingly in the street. Then there's the newest cluster, not really stars at all, more huge balls of antimatter, like Jordan or Lindsay Lohan, who act as sort of sanctioned hate sponges, feeding off the animosity of the general public, growing bigger and bigger until they implode. The sheer amount of vitriol many people harbour for these anti-celebs is staggering. They hate them and hate them and hate them, with the same dogged indignance of racists. <gasps> Good. Still, little wonder the normal, ordinary person feels worthless because the aspirational whirlpool is, if anything, speeding up. Every image on television is growing more glamorous and dreamlike by the moment. The adverts are becoming more unhinged in their desperate quest for things to aspire to. Even everyday products have lost their minds, and they don't even have minds. Wear jewels and flowers every day. Every day? I'm not Elton John. Infuse your clothes with the elegant fragrance of white diamond and lotus flower. Diamonds, I've always thought they reek. Must be a classy product, this. Something really exclusive. Part of the new Infusions collection. From bold two-in-one. A little more luxury in your laundry. <laughs> me, we're doomed. And as for food, well, even dog food, which used to be flogged with a sort of gruff, matronly friendliness... Looks good, it cuts well, and it's meaty. It's nourishment, solid nourishment. <laughs> ...has become a gourmet signature dish for you to plop down in front of some four-legged Caesar. Carefully sourced ingredients, balanced with selected vegetable toppings. Won't look so nice when he shits it out down the park. Actually, it probably will. Even cribs got more extreme with the incredible teen cribs. How are you meant to aspire to be someone's child? All right, enough of that. Let's go check out my spa. And the worship of money, just raw money, got worse so bad there were rap videos which looked more like satirical visions of empty excess. It's actually not clear who this is demeaning the most, the women, black people in general, or me, the viewer. I haven't seen that much money being mindlessly thrown at a shuddering arse since CNN hired Piers Morgan. Before long, behaving like a massive swaggering twat wasn't just acceptable, it was openly encouraged. Who does P did he think he is, King? Faced with all these unattainable dreams, little wonder so many people in so many places got themselves wedged so deep in debt. People bought houses and bragged about how the value kept zooming up through the skyline. In fact, they didn't seem to be houses at all, but enchanted coin-shitting machines. It was all a collective delusion, and none of it was real. And it wasn't just homeowners, no, the whole world had dreamed itself into a wistful financial thought bubble which popped. Today, stock markets across the world tumbled, imploded, continued to collapse like deflated dirigibles. And when the money ran completely dry, so did all your dreams and you'd lose the one thing you were still clinging on to, your aspiration kennel, your home. Still, if you lost your house, you could always apply some of those grand design style tips to your new abode. Simon and Juniper's new home consists of an audacious cardboard hexahedron situated in traditional alleyway surroundings. A flap-style entrance leads to a cosy interior combination living room and sleeping area insulated with reclaimed newsprint flooring. Best of all, the entire structure is recyclable and can be used to bury their bodies should their life together come to an abrupt end during a cold snap.